ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد جزاك الله خير for all of your attendance it's a, a unique honor for myself uh, and brother Abu Hafsa here to be in the oldest uh, masjid in Australia, alhamdulillah. And um, it's a pleasure for you to be here and also we are broadcasting live um, throughout the world on our um, chat service and on our TV station, the first ever uh, fully English Islamic television station to be broadcast out of North America called Guide US TV among the Sheikh Yusuf Estes and Zakir Naik and some other brothers who are joining us, alhamdulillah. The best job in the world. The, this one was was very near and dear to my heart and a very easy topic for me to talk about. It almost flows for me because this is my life. This is, this is what I do. This is the job that I have chosen. And uh, if it was not the best job in the world, I would have stopped a long time ago. Uh, believe me, I've been doing this full time for the past six years. Um, and if it was not the best job in the world, I would have stopped quite a long time ago. But tonight I'm going to tell you why. Why it's the best job in the world and why it is a job that some people need to be doing completely full time as a profession, but everyone needs to be doing it uh, simultaneously, whatever, whatever, whatever else they are doing. And I'm going to do that very, very simply. I'm not going to sit here and quote to you verse after verse and a hadith after hadith, because we could go on and on and on and on and on about that. I'm just going to give you an analogy and a story, inshallah ta'ala. The story goes a little something like this. Let's say me and Abu Hafsa were roommates. We lived with each other. And we have been for about the past week. <laughs> but let's say we lived with each other for a long time. And Abu Hafsa has a disease that is unknown to human beings. It's, it's a new disease, something nobody's ever heard of. And this disease is so terrible, so terrible, that it causes him to be in consistent pain every single moment of the day. It doesn't let him eat, it doesn't let him sleep, it just continuously bothers him. He's just in extremely excruciating pain all day and all night. And this disease is not terminal. It's not something that's going to just kill him off. It's something that will just persist with him and then as long as the law wishes for him to live. If he lives a hundred years, if he lives a hundred years, he's going to feel like this for a hundred years. It's just so painful. And I've known him so long, I've known him for so long, that I have become desensitized to his disease. I come in the door and I see him, I'm like, Salam alaykum ya Habibi, you okay? And he's like, oh, what are you saying? No, I'm hurt. Can you give me that? I'm like, Jazakallah, that's the whole world, inshallah. And I go to my room and I slam the door. And that's it, I'm used to it. And other people come to the house and they're like, you know, you know he's not, he's okay? I'm like, yeah, he's okay. He does it all day. He's all right, he'll be fine, inshallah. And, and, and this is the condition I, uh, I deal with him. And then one day, someone comes up to me on the street, <clears throat> and they hand me something. They hand me a pill. And I, and, I, and I say, what's this? They say, if you give Abu Hafsa this pill, he will be cured. He will be cured without a doubt. And he will be cured to the point that where he will never feel this pain ever again. He will be completely cured. All he has to do is just take this pill. Just give it to him and tell him to take it, and he'll be fine. And I say, okay, I put the pill in my pocket, and guess what? I don't give it to him. I don't give it to him. I put it in my dressing drawer and I leave it. Why? I'll tell you why. I have reasons. Let me tell you. I have reasons. Number one, I'm too busy. I'm way too busy. I have two jobs. I have school. I have, I have you know, things going on. I don't, I don't have time to give him this pill. I'm really, really too busy to play with him and give him this pill. Number two, let me tell you why I don't give it to him. Because I'm not qualified. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. What, what right do I have to prescribe him a medicine? I'm not qualified. If he needs medicine, he needs to go to the doctor. Or the doctor needs to give it to him. Why, why didn't this guy who gave it to me give it to him? Qualification, I'm not qualified. And then number three, of course this is uh, definitely not the way he is, but this Abu Hafs is so stubborn. He's so stubborn. He'll argue with me. I know he will. He's, he's very, very stubborn. 
then I'm not going to waste my time arguing with him with a pill that I know he's not going to take. So I have my reasons. I don't give it to him. I put it in my drawer and tell us, that's it. I leave it there. And I just let him suffer in this condition. And eventually he dies. And, and, and he dies. But when he dies, he dies because of this disease. It doesn't kill him off, but when he dies with it, he dies the most painful death that any human being can imagine to face. Now, I want to ask you a hypothetical question. Do you think that after all of us have died and gone away and Allah resurrects all human beings, do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to call me and Abu Hafsa together and question me about not giving him this medication, this pill? Do you think so? For yes, for sure. I, I oppressed him. I had the opportunity to, to alleviate a situation from him, but I chose not to do so. So there will be some questioning. There will be some questioning. And if Abu Hafsa wants, wants to, he could get his retribution. I oppressed him. I made him suffer. I allowed him to continue to suffer even though I had the opportunity to fix his condition. If he wants, if he could be, that if he wants, he could say, Allah, I want, my, I want my revenge. And Allah could start taking away all of my good deeds and giving it to him because of the oppression I put on him. And if I run out, then he could start taking all of his bad deeds and giving them to me. And, I, and just because of that, I could end up being thrown into hellfire. This is the reality of the situation. But the beauty of Islam, is that I have to put this button in, is the beauty of Islam is that if Abu Hafsa is patient with this illness, and he dies with patience and thank, uh, thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he could be very well that he dies as a shaheed. He goes straight to Jannah. And on the day of judgment, he could stand before Allah and say, Allah, I have forgiven him. I already forgave him. So you forgive him. And we would both be forgiven and go to Jannah together. This is the beauty of Islam. This is the beauty of Islam. But the questioning would take place. There would be some questioning. All, all accounts will be settled on the day of judgment. Everything, even between animals. So some questioning would go down. And it could be very tricky for me, depending on his decisions. Now, I want to tell you something. That there are people who walk around with a disease worse than this. Every day. There are people, millions of people in the world, who have a disease worse than this. Worse than the one I just described. And the worst part about their disease is they don't even know they have it. They're unaware even that they have it. Even though they spread it and infect many people with it. And if people die with it, they're going to die a worse death than the one I talked about. What, 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 what disease could that be? What possible disease could be so bad that it's worse than what I just spoke about? It's the disease of shirk. It is the disease of kufr. It is the disease of being jahil about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the disease of people who worship and associate a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the disease of people who disbelieve in their Lord. It is the disease of people who are ignorant even about who Allah is. This is indeed a more frightening and deadly disease than anything I could have described physically. And people don't even know they have it. They, but you see that you can see the effects when you become in tuned to this thing called da'wah. When you become fine tuned into it, you can see it. You can see the disease. You see the effects of it. You see it on their faces. You see it in their actions. You see it. It's almost like it, it emanates off of them. You can point it out. And this disease is so bad, so bad, that if they do not find a cure for it, and they die in that condition, they will die the most painful death that any human being can ever face. Yes or no? This is according to the authentic hadith of our Rasul sallallahu that the disbeliever, when the angel of death comes to them, when it comes to the believer, it comes in a beautiful image. It comes beautified, smelling good, and, and tells the soul to come out, and the soul just pours out like water. But the disbeliever, the angel of death comes with the worst appearance that anyone can ever imagine, the most frightening thing that anyone will ever see is the disbeliever who will see the angel of death. And the angel of death will yank the soul out through the nose. And our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said that that death will be so painful that it will feel as if the, 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 the flesh is being torn into shreds. So basically it's like you take someone and you just dump them in a human paper shredder. This is the death that awaits them. You know how bad this death is? This death is so painful that our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said that when they are resurrected, 
the effects of that death will still be apparent on their faces. That's how painful it will be, is that the day they are resurrected, the effects of that death will still be visible on their faces. Not only that, but when Allah resurrects them, or the first, let me say that, not only that, but when that soul comes back to that body, in that grave, it will be set up, and the angel will question it. Man rabbuk, and it won't know. It won't know how to answer it, and the angel will punish it. Woman nabiyuk, who is your prophet? It won't know how to answer it, and it will be punished. Woman dinuk, what was your deen? It won't know how to answer it, and it will be punished again. And then, not only that, but the grave will smash in on it so much so that our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the ribs will come together like this. And then, not only that, a door will open up below their feet, and the fire of Jahannam will punish them day in and day out, over and over and over again, until the day of judgment. Not only that, but Allah will pull the, that soul out of the grave and reclothe it with the bones and flesh, and it will have to stand before Allah, knowing what it has done, knowing that there is no recompense for them on this day. And Allah will remind them of everything they did on this life. And it will be commanded for them, and Allah will not look at them, nor will He speak to them, and they will be tossed, dragged on their faces, and tossed into an abyss of fire, to never come out, to never, ever, ever, ever come out, without end. This is what awaits them. That's a, that's a disease, if you ask me. If you want to know a disease, that's a disease. AIDS is a disease, but if death is gone. Cancer is a disease, but if death is done. This is a disease that never leaves the individual forever. It never leaves them. The effects of that disease never departs from them. This is a real disease. And let me say, the worst part about that is, almost every single one, every single person you know, other than the Muslims you know, has it. Almost every single person you interact with every single day, they have that disease. The people who you do business with, whom you go to their stores or they come to your stores, they have it. The co-workers that you stand to, stand next to each and every single day, they have it. Everyone you pass by on the street, most of them, 99.9% .9 of them, they have it. And if they die, this is waiting for them. This is waiting for them. And you know what's even worse than that? What's even worse than that is that we have the pill. We have the pill that can cure them. It was given to us, some of you were, it was given to you on birth. Some of us, we had to work to get it. But still, we, we had it. And that pill is so easy to take. So easy to swallow. So easy on the tongue. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Disease is gone. Disease is gone. The disease and the effects and the death and the punishment and the pain and the grave and the questioning and the resurrection, all is gone. It's gone. It's gone. They don't have to deal with that anymore. And you know what's even worse than the fact that we have the pill? Is that we refuse to give it. We refuse. We absolutely refuse to give it to them. And what's our excuse? Oh, I'll tell you why. We were busy. We're too busy. I have a shop to run. I have a school to go to. I have family. I have kids. I have all these things going on. I don't, I don't have time to get involved in running around giving people this pill. I just don't have time. This is the excuse that we hear. Number two, I am not qualified. I'm not a guy. I'm not an imam. I'm not a sheikh. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable. I don't, I don't have the qualifications to tell someone about Islam. Let me tell you something. If a drug dealer can bring me to Islam, a Muslim who sold drugs as a profession can bring me to Islam, no one has an excuse. No one has an excuse whatsoever. Whatsoever. The only thing he did was he knew he wasn't qualified, so he didn't tell me about what he didn't know. He told me where to go to get the right information. He made sure I went somewhere where I could get the right information. So there is no excuse for us.